Hello everyone, I'm Allison. And I'm Jeremy. And welcome to Soul City Church. We welcome you to our new series, Hope for the Holidays. Now, I don't know about you, Jeremy, but I am slowly easing into getting ready for the holiday seasons. I mean, I bought some lights and maybe like two candles, but uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm you know. well ahead of you. I'm oh, okay. fully ready to go. That's yeah, awesome. I don't know about you, but I need the hope that's at the heart of the season more than ever before. And we actually got a taste of that at our Gratitude Weekend where you, Soul City, help provide a thousand Thanksgiving meals to families in our city. That is just, that's awesome. And now we hope that you'll continue to participate in the spirit of generosity through the rest of our Hope for All journey. You can contribute to the help build the physical house of hope. It's a space where, that's going to be here at Soul City, where folks both inside and outside of the church can come and help find healing, hope, and helpful next steps. Yeah, and you can also participate through our Christmas store, providing families from Brown Elementary, that's the school that's right around the corner from us, a chance to purchase gifts at discounted prices. Yes, so we hope that you'll continue to join us in a few weeks for our virtual Christmas services yeah. when we'll remember together and celebrate the reason for our hope. Now, we invite you to worship with us from right where you are as we lift our voices all across the city. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Into the darkness
Well, hey everyone, welcome to Soul City Church. If this is your first time joining us, we are a group of ordinary people doing life together, discovering what it means to love Jesus and love others the very best we know how here in Chicago and now even outside of Chicago. Our mission is to lead people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. And that has been true of me in my time here at Soul City. I have changed and I have grown. I am not the same person that I was when I came here three years ago. My name's Kelly. I'm one of the pastors here. For the next two weeks, we are in a brand new teaching series called Hope for the Holidays. And although it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, it really doesn't feel that way. I'm all too aware that most of us just experience a very different Thanksgiving, where instead of having a table full of family and friends and your cousin's amazing twice-baked potatoes, you were instead in your apartment on Zoom watching each other eat. You know, in a time that's usually filled with special things to do like holiday parties, I always love holiday parties. I know others of you are relieved that they're canceled. We're instead being instructed to stay home and only go out for work and groceries and a Walgreens run here and there. In the last two weeks, John taught this fantastic series about living in the wilderness. And for some of us, it's not only felt like the unknown of the wilderness, it's felt like the dryness that comes from a desert, a hope desert. This year feels like we've been collectively kicked while we were down. And let's be real, for some of us, it's been way worse than it's been for others. But I know that you want to believe this, that despite what may be going on around us, there is hope. I think it's the reason you're making time to watch this video instead of turn on the news or scroll on your phone. And some level inside of you, whether you feel it right now or not, You want to have a real and lasting hope that goes beyond pandemics and holidays separated from family and friends. Do you know that when I was preparing to write this message, I did what any good pastor would do, and I googled hope. And do you want to know what came up? Articles about a vaccine. And our culture today, hope equals vaccine. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm optimistic about a vaccine, but the hope we're talking about today is different. It's not just a feeling or wishful thinking. Biblical hope is an unshakable confidence that God can be trusted, that he is who he says he is. It's the assurance that his promises are true, even while we wait in the in-between. As we dig in today, my prayer for myself and for us together as a church, that even the smallest flicker of hope inside of us would grow and sink in so that in this season, we would rest in the reality of hope. Doesn't that sound good, to rest in the reality of hope? You know, to be a human living in the realities of our world is to know that life is hard sometimes, but we let things stand in the way of us and the hope that we so desperately need. Why is it that we want it, but we don't let ourselves believe it? Maybe you've been burned by hope in the past. Maybe you prayed and hoped for a physical healing that never came. Or you hoped for a relationship that would turn into more than a friendship, and it didn't happen. And you just hung a little clothes sign on the hope department of your heart. Or maybe you said this before, I'm not even going to get my hopes up because I don't want to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. I have definitely said that. Hope is risky, right? If we hope, we might get hurt. And who wants more of that in their lives? But I believe there's an even bigger cost when we don't allow ourselves to hope. In Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The writer of Proverbs has written a prescription for heart sickness, and it's losing hope. Now, of course, he's not talking about your physical heart, the one with aortas and arteries and blood flowing through it. He's talking about your spiritual heart your center, where your emotions live and breathe and affect your thoughts and feelings. In fact, anytime the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about our spiritual center. Now, I admit I felt this sickness in this season, and I've seen it around me. There have been so many days that I just have not felt like myself, and my life doesn't feel like my life, and I'm just doing the same things over and over again, like the dishes. There are always so many dishes cooking and dishes over and over I know it's been true for me, it might be be true for you, but here's what's also true. Today God has a different invitation for us. 
And it's an invitation to receive hope, real hope. Notice I didn't say give hope. We'll talk more about that next week, but I said receive hope. For some of us, giving to others is our default mode. It feels like second nature to be an uplifting presence that's positive and listening to people and to our community. And to know me is to know that one of my spiritual gifts is encouragement. Maybe it's because I was a cheerleader growing up in junior high and high school, so it's just easy to want to lift other people up. Let's be honest, sixth grade basketball teams need hope. If you grew up, maybe, uh, if you grew up in the church, maybe you saw this too. Be the positive person. See the bright side of things. But today, I want to challenge you to position yourself to receive hope, to be the one being cheered for, as opposed to being the cheerleader. You know, actually receiving hope requires more vulnerability. It's harder because our hearts are open and we're expectant. We have this desired outcome when we hope, and we get to decide if we want to receive it. And today we get to look at the life of Mary, someone that is an incredible example to us of receiving hope. You know, she's the most important mother that ever was. She was a teenage girl that God chose to bring hope through. So if you have a Bible on hand, go ahead, open it up to the Gospel of Luke. Luke is in the New Testament, the second half of your Bible, if you have a physical Bible in front of you. And let's go to chapter 1, verse 26. You might just want to open a tab and go to Bible Gateway to Luke 1, 26. And before we dive in, let me allow you to catch you up on what's already happened until this moment in God's story with this encounter with Mary and an angel. So to recap, God creates this beautiful world and people live it, in it and enjoy it with him, but they mess things up because they want to be God. And side note, that never works out. And they're ultimately separated from him, like really separated from him. Picture wandering through deserts and floods and famines and generations of brokenness and separateness. People doing everything they know how to do to earn their way back into God's good graces. But God had made a promise that he would make a way for his people to be reunited with him again. And there had been some prophecies about a king, a Messiah, who would make a way for God to be reunited back to his people. But they were still wandering in the in-between and in the messy middle. And that's where we pick up at the story in Luke 1. So in verse 26, it writes, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay, so let's just hit pause here for a second, and I want you to step into Mary's shoes for just a moment. She's engaged, she's teenage, she's a virgin, and an angel appears to her, and she doesn't run away, she doesn't shrink back in fear. She stays and she talks to this angel, and he tells her that she's going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been thinking, can you pick someone else? Is someone else available? To know me at that age is to know that I was focused on dance and homework and trying to get my really bad skin cleared up. Those were my priorities. Can you imagine the town gossip about her, the judgments cast on her, the suspicion over her, none of which at her own doing? And check this out in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. In this moment of disruption and shock and confusion, she chooses to receive. She chooses to say yes. 
Mary is the first to receive the hope of Christmas, the hope of the world, the hope of glory. The seed of salvation is planted in her. But before she shares this hope with the world, she holds it and she ponders it and she leans on it to carry her through. And after spending some time with her friend Elizabeth, who's also pregnant, she breaks out in complete praise and adoration of God her Father, the one who her hope is in. In this portion of scripture known as the Magnificat, or Mary's song, it's been sung and chanted in churches for hundreds of years. In verse 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Mary just spills open with praise. And my guess is that she can do that because she has chose to let hope make a home inside of her. When she could have chosen to be cynical or skeptical or give in to her natural fear, she trusted in God's promised faithfulness, even in the most bizarre circumstances. Mary's capacity to trust God in that moment and receive hope was not something that just happened in that moment. It was a trust and hope that was cultivated in all the other little in-between, not so eventful and ordinary moments with God. It wasn't a hope that was only in her mind. It was embedded in her soul. And observing Mary's life teaches us about two different kinds of hope. Head hope and heart hope. Let me explain. Head hope is like the quick little pep talk that you give yourself in your mind when you're feeling anxious or when you found out you might have been exposed to someone with COVID because that's a thing, right? Like on the regular, that happens. It's the passing and not long lasting hit of, I'm sure it'll be fine. It's a temporary surface level band-aid. And sometimes it works. For me, when I live in my head, I can intellectualize why there's hope. Just a few weeks ago in counseling, I was talking about a really tough and tender situation. And through my tears, I was saying all these head-level hope rational statements, which must have sounded ridiculous. And my counselor said, it doesn't really matter if you know it in your head, but it doesn't make its way to your heart. You know, my mind was capable of knowing that I should be hopeful. What I didn't have was heart hope. Heart hope is different. There's a depth to it. When you have heart hope, and the peripheral vision of your life. You can remember the times when you've struggled and God has seen you through. There's an unwaveringness about it. It comes from a still, small voice of Holy Spirit inside of you. Eugene Peterson says this about this level of hope. He says, it's the imagination, but in the harness of faith. It's a willingness to let God do it his way and in his time. I kind of think of it like a tetherball. You've probably played one of those before, right? You can hit the ball and it swings all over, but it's connected to something that's firmly planted in the ground, so it can't wander too far. It's anchored. That's what heart hope is. You know, these two types of hope are so different. Head hope is temporary. It's like an energy bar when you're out for a run and you're so hungry and you just need something. Now, to be clear, I don't run, so don't go thinking I know this from experience. But I imagine it gets you through the moment, but it leaves you empty and longing for more. Head hope is tied to our circumstances, like having a good-paying job that provides for you and your family. I think it can give us a sense of security because on the surface, things are okay. And when things aren't so good with our circumstances and we lose that job, our hope is tanked. And lastly, in head hope, we trust ourselves. We rely on how we can figure this out. And this is where I think about all the things I can do to make my situation better, ways that I'm going to rescue myself and not experience pain. But heart hope is different. It's cultivated. Rather than being in the temporary, it's time-tested for generations and promises because rather than being tied to circumstances, heart hope is tied to truth truth that never changes, 
Truth that as we grow with God, it only takes deeper root in our hearts and souls. Truth that cannot be shaken. Remembering the truth of God's faithfulness in your life. And finally, the last distinctive of heart hope is that it trusts in God consciously over and over again. This type of hope isn't tricked into believing that we can be God and figure things out, but rather chooses healthy and helpful surrender. You know, this summer I found myself in a situation where I was grasping for hope. It was a Saturday morning and I needed some time away from my family, and I love them, but absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's a true saying. So I called my mom to see if she wanted to hang out for a while, and I went over to her house, and it was just the two of us uh, sitting on her brown couch, And as we were talking, she shared with me that she had gone to the doctor because she had found some lumps on her neck that she was concerned about. And the doctor was also concerned about it and asked that she would make an appointment to get them scanned. And my stomach dropped and my eyes immediately filled with tears and I felt fear all over me. And I was consciously trying to not let that happen, but it did. And my mind raced with all the possibilities of what could be going on with her. And I grasped for any head of hope I could muster in the moment. I made plans in my mind of all the possible next steps. I overthought it. I offered up Hail Mary prayers about it. And a friend took her to the appointment for that next test, and they still didn't have the answers. And they asked her to get an MRI, and I thought, I cannot live in this type of fear for another few weeks while we wait for answers. And I didn't share it with many people because I didn't even want to speak it out loud. But I had this moment of talking with God that went something like this. This is like the churchy version. I got all my feelings out, my anger, my sadness, more anger, fear. And then God reminded me of all the things he's seen me through. The different seasons of my life when I was relying fully on him. And I had this quiet moment with God where I said, okay, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen or or what these results are going to show, but I know this much. I have hope because you're with me and you've never left me and I can't face alone this alone and I also don't have to face it alone. It was the first moment I really allowed myself to receive real heart hope. And I'll be honest, it did not erase my fear, but it tethered it. It put my fear in its place. And a few weeks later, after another test, my mom got the results back. And to our relief, there was no reason for concern. But what a test for my hope muscle. So here's our work for the week. I want to invite you to receive hope. And as with any invitation, you have a choice whether you want to receive it or not. I've chosen a few different verses from scripture that are pillars and examples to me of a deep hope to hold on to. And I want you to choose one, to claim one. You can tell people, this is my verse. This is the hope that I'm hanging on to. This is the hope that I'm choosing to receive this season to remind you to trust God. And I've invited my friend Dottie to read this scripture over us because I can't think about heart hope without thinking about her. I met Dottie in my Soul City small group this fall, just about three months ago, and she has this wisdom that comes from living life with God for a long time and a generous and infectious spirit about her that everyone loves. She actually lives in Missouri, but because of Zoom, we now have Soul City people all over the country. And in about week three of our small group, we were talking about the different walls we've hit with God in our lives, and Dottie shared some of her story with us. And what she shared broke our hearts. She shared that several years ago now, her daughter was abused by her now former husband when she was younger and that he's now in prison. And the dreams that she had for her family were shattered with that revelation and made her a single mom, not only of a daughter who had just experienced this trauma, but of a special needs son and the main caretaker for her elderly mother. You know, her life has not been easy. Her circumstances are not easy. Some of them are level 10 devastating. And I think our group was 
like taken aback that day to know that Dai had experienced this type of pain and darkness. Because to know her is to know that she is a woman of heart hope. The type of hope that holds others up without even trying. It's a mature hope and a confident hope, and you can't help but feel it when you're around her. You can even tell it in the tone of her voice and the authority she has when she prays. You know, Dottie works at the post office, and hope propels her to pray over the important mail that she sends every day. And she told me that throughout the storms in her life, that the hope of Jesus has been her life vest in the midst of her being in the open waves of the ocean. You know, I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you've been walking through, but I want you to hear me say this. There is hope. And this Christmas season, Jesus is inviting us to rest in that type of heart hope. A hope that isn't in a vaccine or life returning to normal or even a fleeting momentary pep talk to make yourself feel better. But a hope that you can hold on to as an anchor for your soul. And I'm going to give you just a few seconds now to ask the Holy Spirit to make it clear to you, to make one verse stand out to you. We'll put them on the screen too for you to read. Just ask God for a verse. I know some of you are so tired and discouraged and hope has been too far from your heart and you have not been well. And I'm trusting that God is going to meet you here, that he wants to refuel your soul, that he wants to offer you a deep and everlasting hope that will transform your heart. And as Dottie reads these verses on this video from Missouri, I pray that any flicker of hope inside of you would grow. So just take a moment and be quiet and ask God to give you the gift of hope through truth from scripture. And then Dottie will read these verses over us. Psalm 105. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Isaiah 40, 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that your message is a message of hope that we're not alone, that our life is not the sum of our circumstances and the waves that come crashing in around us, God, but that you are an anchor that is sure, that we can have time-tested, long-lasting hope on your faithfulness. And so, God, I just pray right now that your spirit would pour hope out over our church Would you pray, uh, would you pour hope out this community? Would it seep down inside of us in the places where hope hasn't been for a really long time? And God, I pray that that hope would make us well. That we wouldn't be sick because of being so far from hope. But God, that hope would make a home in us. That hope would heal us. 
that hope would transform us in this season that we would know no matter what we face, that we face it with you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. For being with us today soul city as always check out ways to dive deeper in today's message on our church refresh page thank you for continuing your faithful giving we believe god is inviting each of you into a generosity journey and if you want to begin or continue that adventure today you can by giving online or via text soul city we love you and we miss you merry christmas and we'll see you next week 